Hey there, welcome to YouTube. If you are into poetry, if you are into literature, if you are into cultural history, then you've come to the right place. Cardboard Box Productions makes podcasts about all those things, so be sure to click the subscribe button and turn on the notification bell so that you never miss a new episode. Obviously, we mostly make podcasts, so you can also go to anywhere you get your podcasts, if it's a, a place other than YouTube, uh, like Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and you can subscribe to our podcast feeds there. All right, I hope you enjoy this episode. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Close Talking, the world's most popular poetry analysis podcast from Cardboard Box Productions Incorporated. I am co-host Jack Rossiter Munley, and with my good friend Connor McNamara Stratton, we read a poem, talk about the poem, and read the poem again. Before we get into today's selection, a quick note that if you like what we do here at Close Talking and have a spare minute of your time, it would mean the world to us if you would give the podcast a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Those ratings and reviews help boost us up the algorithm and find new listeners. And if you have suggestions for future episodes or comments on this one, you can send us an email at closetalkingpoetry at gmail.com. And you can also find us on social media. On Twitter, the show is at Close Talking. I am at Jack Rossiter Munn, and Connor is at Connor M. Stratton. On Instagram, the show is at Close Talking Poetry, and on Facebook, it's facebook.com slash close talking. We also have a website, closetalking.com, where you can find all the past episodes of the show, and Cardboard Box Productions has just launched a newsletter, Unboxed, and if you go to cardboardboxproductionsinc.com, you can subscribe for more behind-the-scenes stuff on Close Talking and all of the other literary and cultural history podcasts that Cardboard Box Productions makes. On with the show. Hello, and welcome to this extra special inauguration episode of Close Talking. I am co-host Jack Rossiter Munley, and today, Connor and I will be discussing Walt Whitman's Specimen Days, Inauguration Day, March 4th. Before we begin, a quick reminder that you can subscribe to Close Talking on the iTunes Store, or listen on Stitcher or SoundCloud. Today is Inauguration Day in the United States. For the first time since Robert Frost read John F. Kennedy's inauguration in 1961, there will not be an inaugural poem. Perhaps there is no great meaning to be found in this. However, I will note that a recent report indicates that the budget cuts proposed by the incoming administration include the privatization of PBS and the elimination of the National Endowment for the Arts and the National Endowment for the Humanities. Much as we decided that we could not let the election pass without some reflection, Connor and I decided that we would share with you our thoughts on an inauguration-themed poem. Today's featured work is Walt Whitman's personal reflection on the second inauguration of Abraham Lincoln. And before getting to the show, I wanted to share two short excerpts, the closing words of Lincoln's first and second inaugural addresses, speeches given to a divided nation in moments of great uncertainty. The first. We are not enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies. Though passion may have strained, it must not break our bonds of affection. The mystic cords of memory, stretching from every battlefield and patriot grave to every living heart and hearthstone all over this broad land, will yet swell the chorus of the Union, when again touched, as surely they will be, by the better angels of our nature. From the second. With malice towards none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle and for his widow and his orphan, 
to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. Welcome to another episode of Close Talking. I am Jack Rossiter Munley. And I'm Connor McMurray Stratton. And we come to you today to talk about poetry. Woo! We choose one poem, we read it at the beginning of the show, we discuss it for the entirety of the show, and then at the end, we read it again, hopefully, having pulled more meaning out of it than potentially even the author intended. That's the dream. You never know. Today, we are talking about a poem that I chose that's maybe not technically a poem. It is a little segment from Walt Whitman's Specimen Days, which is a work of sort of notebook pieces and essays and some sketches, actually, that came out later in his life. It's sort of the big work of his later life in addition to the final version of Leaves of Grass. Uh, Walt Whitman, as many of you know, was one of the great American poets of the 19th century, born in 1819 and died in 1892. Uh, his best known work is Leaves of Grass, which, fun fact in the modern age, he self-published. He paid for the publishing of it at a local shop and they printed it in between their commercial commissions. Whoa. In 1855. So for all those of you out there self-publishing your work, you're in good company. Walt Whitman agrees with you. Wow, that's um, amazing. Right? How cool is that? Uh, obviously, he found an audience. He became well-loved even during his life and became fairly popular for his work. He had a whole bunch of different kind of random government jobs at different stages uh, to, to pay the bills. But he always did poetry, and when he died, it was a pretty major, major event. He was a well-liked literary figure even during his own time. Uh, and Leaves of Grass, very controversial work, condemned for its obscenity, possibly cost Walt Whitman jobs during different parts of his life when it came out that people knew what it contained. He was an avid lover of nature, and also someone who had a deep sense of the poet as a member of society and the poet as an artist who had a commitment of a special kind to society. One quote of his that I think speaks to this really well that I often think of is uh, the proof of a poet is that his country absorbs him as affectionately as he absorbs it, which I think is a sort of interesting sentiment. And he has a lot of different thoughts and phrases along those lines about how a poet really necessarily needs to be in conversation with society, a commenter on society, and really involved with his community and his country. So the, for lack of a better term, poem that I picked is called Specimen Days, The Inauguration, which are his notes on uh, Abraham Lincoln's second inauguration, which he attended. So here we go. Specimen Days, the inauguration. March 4th. The president very quietly rode down to the Capitol in his own carriage by himself on a sharp trot around noon, either because he wished to be on hand to sign bills or to get rid of marching in line with the absurd procession the muslin temple of liberty and pasteboard monitor. I saw him on his return at three o'clock after the performance was over. He was in his plain two horse barouche, barouche and looked very much worn and tired. The lines indeed of vast responsibilities, intricate questions and demands of life and death cut deeper than ever upon his dark brown face yet all the old goodness, tenderness, sadness, and canny shrewdness underneath the furrows. I never see that man without feeling that he is one to become personally attached to, for his combination of purest, heartiest tenderness and native Western form of manliness. By his side sat his little boy of 10 years, 
there were no soldiers, only a lot of civilians on horseback with huge yellow scarves over their shoulders riding around the carriage. At the inauguration four years ago, he rode down and back again, surrounded by a dense mass of armed cavalrymen eight deep with drawn sabers, and there were sharpshooters stationed at every corner on the route. I ought to make mention of the closing levy of Saturday last night. Never before was such a compact jam in front of the White House. All the grounds filled and away out to the spacious sidewalks. I was there as I took a notion to go, was in the rush inside with the crowd, surged along the passageways, the blue and other rooms, and through the great East Room. Crowds of country people, some very funny. Fine music from the Marine Band off in a side place. I saw Mr. Lincoln, dressed all in black, with white kid gloves and a claw hammer coat, receiving, as in duty bound, shaking hands, looking very disconsolate, as if he would give anything to be somewhere else. Whew. Very interesting. It's so weird to hear this. It's like. It's so intimate, but yeah, anyway. Um. It's this fascinating intimacy that Whitman himself calls out and this sort of kinship or connection he feels to Abraham Lincoln. Um, see, but he has the line, um, I never see that man without feeling he is one to become personally attached to, uh, which, for me, it reminds me also of FDR when he died and his uh, body was being taken around by train. A lot of people, even those who didn't vote for him, really felt like he was their president. And there's a lot of people who voted for him. He won with pretty decent margins, particularly in his later election during World War II, who really felt that he was someone who was looking out for them and that he was their president, the nation's president. And I think that, you know, Lincoln, to a much lesser extent, he barely won his first election. He presided over the Civil War. It was a divided nation. He as a figure has become one of unity. But I think this attachment that Whitman talks about is one that maybe wasn't broadly felt at the time, but is one that was very powerfully within Lincoln as a person. There's a lot of accounts of him during his life as a storyteller, as an incredibly relatable person who knew how to talk to different people and just had a certain sense about him. He wasn't the loudest voice. He wasn't the one that spoke up most often, but his voice was one that was almost whatever room he was in that was listened to. And he was respected by those who came across him. Yeah, and it's interesting that that's in the parenthetical um i i don't know it's like it's such a lovely aside and it's almost i don't know whenever i get a parenthetical it's like who are we often there's like a redirect of like what who the audience is or if i'm talking to myself now um and i think that makes it so much more intimate in that way um and we get two parentheticals in this piece. There's the parenthetical where Whitman reflects on the special kind of person he thinks Lincoln is. And we get another parenthetical reflecting on what the previous inauguration was like, which was much more militarized and much, you know, more full of the parts of it that A, we see Whitman finding a little ridiculous and B, we see him ascribing the same kinds of thoughts to Lincoln. Yeah, I think like his sense of who Lincoln is, is not someone who's interested in all of this pomp. At the beginning, we see him talking about Lincoln potentially avoiding it. He doesn't know. Maybe that's what's going on. And then at the end, we see, I guess, the evidence that Whitman is kind of citing for that reading of Lincoln at the inauguration, which is this party at the White House, where Whitman's impression is that Lincoln probably doesn't want to be doing this. Yeah. Yeah, that ending really sells this little piece. I mean, that last sentence, I saw Mr. Lincoln dressed all in black with white kid gloves and a claw hammer coat 
receiving as in duty bound, shaking hands, looking very disconsolate as if, and as if he would give anything to be somewhere else. Um, that's just amazing. I mean, the idea, I don't know, it's like, well, A, you know, you're just like sad for the president. Uh, and it's, you know, very close up, but also the way that the sentence is um, composed, it's a very like slow, slow pivoting with clauses um, where we have, you saw Mr. Lincoln, then we have, you know, he's, he's dressed in all black, he's got this coat and these gloves and, you know, and then receiving comma, as in duty bound, comma, shaking hands, comma, looking very disconsolate and as if he would give anything to be somewhere else. Suddenly there's this very long phrase after a lot of short clauses in this sentence. Which really helps drive it home. And each one of those clauses is either rooting us in where we are or rooting us in the sense of how Lincoln feels about this or what that arena is like for him because we're either being told what he looks like or why he's there at all if he wants to be somewhere else he's duty bound to be there this is the office he sought and it's the one that he was just re-elected to so he sought it again after it was incredibly hard the lines on his face are deep and they speak of all of these responsibilities that have weighed on him for you know many many years and the most famous pictures of Lincoln are those that circulate showing him before and after the presidency to demonstrate the toll of the Civil War, that he looks just like a ghost by the end, just completely ravaged. And the idea that this duty bound to be where he might never want to be, there's a reason that he's called to be there within him. I think that's part of what gives it its power. And the sense we're given is the first inauguration of Lincoln was militarized in between the Civil War has happened, it's ended. And a lot of that and the peace now has to be presided over by someone who can actually work for it. And Whitman, I think, is implying that part of the drive that Lincoln feels is that he's the person to do this great work. And Whitman is backing that up with his observations of how Lincoln comports himself in these grander settings that maybe yeah. he's someone who'd rather be on his own maybe he's someone who would you know his ideal the life that would make him the happiest is hanging out back on a farm in illinois or just telling stories to friends but he understands the gifts that he has as a person those that whitman recognizes in him and so he feels that he is called, he is duty bound, not just to stand in his coat with his gloves to receive people in the White House, but he's called to work for those people and accomplish all that his gifts can. No, I think that's, that's exactly right. It's very, um, it's such an interesting, I don't know, I can't get over how just unique this kind of piece this document is in a way like as a as a record of a you have two titan figures in history you know it's not like some rando who like was friends with lincoln or something it, you know this is walt whitman um and, and it's not just walt whitman writing about abraham lincoln it's Walt Whitman writing about Abraham Lincoln's second inaugural, which is perhaps considered the greatest inaugural address a president has ever given. So you've got Whitman talking about Lincoln at Lincoln's pinnacle moment. The details of that, I, I was just trying to think of, um, I don't know, I just found myself thinking about Obama a lot and how, what, I don't know. It's like everything is so like, I feel like, like when I read, um, uh, I never see that man without feeling that he is one to become personally attached to. Like, that's how I feel about Obama personally. Like, even if I don't agree with everything that he's done or even if blah, 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 like I see him and I'm like, yes, like Obama and Michelle, 
those are, I mean, that's why this is in part. So this transition is so devastating because I have sort of emotional affection for my president, which I never thought that that would happen. Um, but at the same time, I was trying to think of if I had read anything and I'm not the most well read on like pieces on Obama that has this kind of intimacy that also doesn't feel staged, you know, which is a partly difficult, you know, or partisan, because if yeah. you look at this, it's a record of a political event and yeah. a political figure, but you don't see anything about his policies in here. You just mm -hmm. see an appreciation of the man. Right. And I think that that's something that you don't see very often in particularly, I'd say, 20th century American politics, particularly the second half of the 20th century. Very rarely in their time, because that's something else important to remember. This is him reflecting on it as it's happening, and it was published not long after Lincoln's death. But in their time, people who are reflecting on presidents, whether they agree with them or disagree with them, Reflecting on the man, I think the closest you'd come is people offering appreciations of Jimmy Carter's ex-presidency, but that has little to do with when he was in office. And in fact, many people, even those who greatly appreciate his ex-presidency, look pretty disparagingly on his time in office. The appreciation of the person of Lincoln is what really does stand out in this, and I think you see that feeling in a lot of people but i don't know that you see it coming through in sort of the leading voices of the time offering appreciations of obama the man or george w bush the man yeah no uh, and i it makes me think if i can offer a sort of general like generalization hot take okay it was i just thought of this i have no idea but i was thinking about it and i thought it's so marvelous that this is in writing and this is like a little piece of literature. And then I was thinking like one difficulty of photography and film is the person who you are studying is going to be in the room at the time of production. So you can, you can edit it. You obviously edit it or whatever outside, but you write, on your own time, in your own space, apart from the subject that you're thinking about. Um, and that to me, and you know, if you're sort of a journalist, I mean, there's that great um, David Remnick, New Yorker piece about Obama that's very long that came out recently. You know, he spends time with Obama. So there's, there's that relationship. In that, in that way, it's similar to sort of film or photography in which the sort of author is affecting and in the space of the person they are writing about. But at the same time, more other kinds of writing and the act of writing happen separately. And I think that allows for an important distance, but also independence of the writer to the subject that's being sort of observed or talked about. Hot take over. I like that hot take. <laughs> that, that hot take is scorching and I think <laughs> right on the money trying to find a corollary where there's in writing and it's a reflection on the person it's not at the same level of whitman and lincoln but the closest i can think of sadly not a president is hillary clinton and particularly the online community of female supporters who offered so many appreciations of what she as a person accomplished in her life regardless of views on her policies, which obviously most of them agree with, but the kinds of appreciations that you would find written about her weren't just about her government accomplishments, but about her character, her personal drive, and her story, which maybe you think she presides over child pedophile rings in pizza parlors. If so, uh. stop listening, never listen again, and fuck you <laughs> forever. <laughs> because Hillary Clinton is a goddamn gift. Seconded, seconded. Perhaps you find her a power-hungry bitch. Again, out, now, turn it off, leave forever, unsubscribe. Seconded. Came from essentially a small business owner family 
imbued with faith at an early age. You cannot argue that this woman does not have an incredible personal drive to accomplish the most good for the most people in every way she can. You can argue with how she's done it. You can argue with the mechanisms. You can argue that she should have done more at different instances, but I think it's very hard to argue against her personal view of what she was doing and how she was trying to accomplish it. Come at me, bro, close talking poetry at gmail.com. Feel free to let me know if you disagree. We can have a great frank discussion in which I can elucidate to you the ways that you are wrong. Dear listener. <laughs> But in terms of an appreciation of who she is as a person, those online communities really were doing that. Hmm. That's really interesting. I think the difference is that these are highly partisan communities. Right, right. And this is, I mean, Whitman was a big supporter of Lincoln. He was, you know, progressive. It didn't initially like abolition, but came around to it uh, pretty quickly. Had, you know, was on the wrong side of the censors his whole life lots of explicit sexuality, deep connections to nature, and was pretty avid about nude sunbathing and stuff. Like he would, you know, look at a picture of the guy and tell me that you think he was Captain Business of the Economy Squad. And <laughs> I don't think that'll happen. <laughs> oh, man. No, that's right. And one, one thing that, that makes me think of is, because um, one thing that this struck me this piece, this Whitman piece struck me as like, I was like, and, and this is partly because I have not been exposed to it, but I was like, Lincoln, oh, like Lincoln is a guy or like is a person, human flesh character. And I feel like, you know, in the way that good writing does, I feel like I know him a little bit, which I have never felt about Lincoln, even though I saw Spielberg's blah, blah, blah movie about it. Um, and that especially seems so important and lacking. I mean, uh, perhaps those uh, online communities are serving that purpose, but for my own self, I'm always like skeptical of any opinion that I find myself forming about who these are as people because, you know, so much of it is crafted. And even though Whitman's piece is so subjective and is clearly subjective, so it's not it nevertheless, it reading it and, and reading it to myself, and part of that is the reading it to myself, rather than watching the news with a bunch of people, is like I have a little moment with Lincoln in that piece, you know? And it's like I've never felt like I had access to have a moment with a sort of contemporary politician. And what Whitman does with that moment is so special because he gives you such insight into Lincoln as a person, paints him in such human terms, and without endorsing his policies, gives you these hints at what he thinks that greatness has meant for the country. He's very interested in that connection between the personal and the individual and the community. Mm -hmm. Just in general, in all of his work, Whitman's very interested in that connection. The, the artist or the individual in society is something that he sort of explores. But the way that he hints at it is so subtle because it's, it really is just his impressions of what's going on. And so when he's looking at this inauguration, he reflects on the previous one. But in doing that, you necessarily see militarization of that one compared to this one. You necessarily see the change that's happened in the country that it's hard not to see as good without having to dig into the politics of the civil war, the reality of the war, you know, all of the struggles of the last four years in the nation. Whitman slides that in as the backdrop, which again, a hallmark of strong writing. He's not just doing that to do it. He's doing it in service of his reflection reflections on Lincoln, the man. Yeah. Yeah. Should we uh, read it? Do you have anything more? I do not have anything more other than I highly doubt that anything like this will be produced in the United States over the next four years. God help <laughs> us all. <laughs> oh, I fuck. swear this reflection on an inauguration, no one shall write about January 20th, 2017. In fact, if I were to bet the historical resonances 
that are to be drawn from that inauguration, it will be akin to the changes that are often ascribed to 1913. <laughs> Where you have this massive falling together of cultural and political and historical forces in a really poisonous soup that created the elements of the world we live in today. We're at a restructuring moment in history, and this kind of reflection shall not be produced. I will tell you, that soup, not vegan. The blood of the innocent runneth deep within said soup. <laughs> All right. Two quick things that I would like to note. You'll notice Whitman completely skips over the inauguration itself. He talks about Lincoln going to and from it, but does not talk about the performance, as he calls it, which is where Lincoln delivered these words that have resonated so powerfully through history. Mm -hmm. And just very quickly, at the end, how brilliant is it that Lincoln, in receiving all these people, not that he doesn't love them, but that he'd like to be anywhere else. He doesn't need to be surrounded by people. On that... Specimen days. Yes, on that... Carried away. <laughs> <clears throat> Specimen days, the inauguration, March 4th. The president, very quietly, rode down to the Capitol in his own carriage, by himself, on a sharp trot around noon, either because he wished to be on hand to sign bills or to get rid of marching in line with the absurd procession. The Muslim Temple of Liberty and Pasteboard Monitor. I saw him on his return at three o'clock after the performance was over. He was in his plain two-horse barouche and looked very much worn and tired. The lines indeed of vast responsibilities, intricate questions, and demands of life and death cut deeper than ever upon his dark brown face. Yet all the old goodness, tenderness, sadness, and canny shrewdness underneath the furrows. I never see that man without feeling that he is one to become personally attached to for his combination of purest, heartiest tenderness and native Western form of manliness. By his side sat his little boy of 10 years. There were no soldiers, only a lot of civilians on horseback with huge yellow scarves over their shoulders riding around the carriage. At the inauguration four years ago, he rode down and back again, surrounded by a dense mass of armed cavalrymen eight deep with drawn sabers, and there were sharpshooters stationed at every corner on the route. I ought to make mention of the closing levy of Saturday night last. Never before was such a compact jam in front of the White House. All the grounds filled and away out to the spacious sidewalks. I was there, as I took a notion to go was in the rush inside with the crowd, surged along the passageways and the blue and other rooms and through the great east room. Crowds of country people, some very funny. Fine music from the Marine Band, off in a side place. I saw Mr. Lincoln, dressed all in black, with white kid gloves and a claw hammer coat, receiving, as is duty bound, shaking hands, looking very disconsolate, and as if he would give anything to be somewhere else. This is co-host Jack Roster Munley. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, head on over to Apple Podcasts, leave a review. Five stars, maybe? Those reviews help with the algorithm and are a great way for us to find new listeners. And you can put anything in them. You can write whatever you want. You can just say, oh, this is a good podcast. I like this podcast. You could be like, hey, that Connor guy, he makes a lot of good points. Uh, Jack, why is he doing this outro so long? You know, get him off the mic. And whatever you feel like writing, head on over there. Five stars. Drop in the review. Uh, do you have thoughts about this poem? Is there a poem or poet you'd like us to cover on a future episode? Well, we'd love to hear from you. And there are tons of ways that you can get in touch with us. I mean, I guess you could drop it into an iTunes review. You could be like, five stars. Hey, why don't you talk about, insert name of poet here. 
Um, but you can also send us an email. That's probably the best way to do it. Close talking poetry at gmail.com is our email address. Or you can find us on Twitter. I am at Jack Rossiter Munn. Connor is at Connor M. Stratton. And the show is at Close Talking. On Instagram, you can find us there too. Uh, we are at Close Talking Poetry. And we are on Facebook at facebook.com slash close talking. We haven't gotten to TikTok yet, and we might never. Who knows? Anything is anything's possible. Um, speaking of all those social media platforms, a very special thank you to our incredible social media manager, Corey China, who keeps us active across the internet. And a thank you to all of you for listening. We will see you next time. Mm-hmm.